Hebrews chapter 4 verses 1 through 11 and the King James text today reads as follows. Let us therefore fear lest a promise being left us of entering into his rest any of you should seem to come short of it. For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them, but the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. For we which have believed do enter into rest, as he said. As I have sworn in my wrath, if they shall enter into my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. For he spake in a certain place of the seventh day on this wise. And God did rest the seventh day from all his works. And in this place again, if they shall enter into my rest. Seeing therefore it remaineth that some must enter therein, and they to whom it was first preached entered not in because of unbelief. Again he limiteth a certain day, saying to David, Today, after so long a time, as it is said today, if ye will hear his voice, harden not your hearts. For if Jesus, and in this case, folks, this literally means Joshua. This is not speaking of the New Testament Jesus. This is speaking of the Old Testament Joshua, but it's using the New Testament Greek name Jesus. For if Jesus or if Joshua had given them rest, then would he not afterward have spoken of another day. There remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. For he that is entered into his rest, he also hath ceased from his own works as God did from his. Let us labor therefore to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. I'm asking the question today, are you still working? Are you still working? Let's go to the Lord one more time. Master, one more time. We come before the throne of grace. We humble ourselves in your presence and yet we enter boldly. Oh, Master, for the word of God declares that we therefore might come boldly under the throne of grace. We need the anointing, the presence of the Holy Ghost. We need a touch from heaven. No man, no woman, no boy, no girl could possibly do this great sacred word of God any justice in sharing it. Were it not for the anointing of the Holy Ghost and the touch of God. Master, in the name of Jesus, right now we ask God that you would touch this body, touch this mind, touch this tongue that I might speak the word of God plainly in love for the benefit of your people. Touch every mind, not just the ear, but every mind of all that hear, whether it be by recording, whether it be live. And allow us, so oh God, today to be in a place and a frame of mind to receive what the Spirit of the Lord would speak unto the church at this hour. For we ask it in that mighty, saving name, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Praise God and amen. Are you still working? I want to read 
Hebrews 4, 1 through 11 to you from the NIV. I'll tell you why. The King James sounds like a puzzle of words. It, it, that particular passage is not easily understood uh, to the average reader. So I want to read to you from the NIV. And that will help to clarify this a little bit right from the starting line. Therefore, since the promise of entering his rest still stands, let us be careful that none of you be found to have fallen short of it. For we also have had the good news proclaimed to us just as they did. He's referring to the Gentile nations as well as he said just as the Jews did. But the message they heard, the Jewish people, was of no value to them because they did not share the faith of those who obeyed. Now we who have believed entered that rest just as God has said. So I declared on oath in my anger, they shall never enter my rest. The Lord is talking about when the people of Israel were going into the land of promise and they were disobedient and they were grumpy and gripey and complaining and full of unbelief. He said, I swore in my anger they will never enter into my rest. And yet his works have been finished since the creation of the world. For somewhere he has spoken about the seventh day or the Sabbath day. In these words, quote, On the seventh day God rested from all his works, end quote. And again in the passage above he says, quote, They shall They shall never enter my rest. Therefore, since it still remains for some to enter that rest, and since those who formerly had the good news proclaimed to them did not go in because of their disobedience, God again set a certain day, calling it today. This he did when a long time later he spoke through David as in the passage already quoted. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. For if Joshua had given them rest, God would not have spoken later about another day. There remains then a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For anyone who enters God's rest also rests from their works just as God did from His. Let us therefore make every effort to enter that rest so that no one will perish by following their example of disobedience. So the Lord is saying in a nutshell, I told the children of Israel that I would lead them to a place of rest, that they would only have to work, they would only have to struggle long enough to occupy the land that I had given them. But once they became the occupants, they would be able to breathe a great sigh of relief and they would be able to rest and they would be able to enjoy the land that I had bestowed them with. He said, however, because of their disobedience and their unbelief, I vowed that they would not, in fact, enter into that rest. And I made a promise that one day God's people would be able to enter into a place of rest. 
And Paul said, therefore, Joshua, who led the people of Israel into the land of promise following the death of Moses, he said, therefore, Joshua was not able to lead them into that rest that God had initially promised, but God now pushed back the rest and said, the rest that I'm promising will come at a later time. Oh, Joshua could not lead the people of God into a place of rest. But Jesus, the second Joshua, could. Hallelujah. Oh, praise the name of the Lord. And Paul said at the beginning of our text, Let us therefore fear lest a promise being left us of entering into his rest any of you should seem to come short of. Begin the NIV, therefore, since the promise of entering his rest still stands, let us be careful that none of you be found to have fallen short of it. How many Christians in our world today have fallen short of the promise set forth by the Lord of rest. They believe and obey the gospel of Jesus Christ and then immediately they move into a mindset of salvation by works. Salvation that is contingent upon their efforts and their abilities. And instead of coming into the rest that the Lord Jesus Christ promised, they come into a whole new set of turmoil and struggle. And what they don't understand, Tommy, is that all that turmoil and all that struggle is born out of unbelief. They don't get it. They don't understand how this gospel works. They do not understand that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is our full and complete answer to the issue of sin. Anybody who thinks that believing and obeying the gospel must be mixed and mingled with works and actions in order to be saved, my friend, does not understand this gospel. There are times when I'll shoot Tommy a text or I'll call him. It'll be 5.30, it'll be quarter to 6. Maybe I'm cooking dinner at home and I'm curious as to how far from the house he might be. And I need to know because I don't want dinner to be ruined by making things too far in advance that potentially could, you know, go bad or soften or harden or, or overcook. So I need to know the timing a little bit better. And therefore, I'll shoot him a text or I'll shoot him a phone call and I'll say, uh, where are you at? How close are you to home? Anticipating that his answer will be, well, I'm on the road, I'm on my way, I'm thus far, I've reached this point. But all too often as I call or I text him, the answer that I get back from him is this, I'm still working. What? You're still working. I thought the time for your labor had come to an end. Oh, children, I hope you're hearing me today. I thought your work day had come to an end. I thought it was after five o'clock and you were supposed to be free to go home after five. Well, I am, but there was just so much that I yet needed to do 
that I decided I would stay and I would continue to work. Oh, children, too many people come to the foot of the cross and they repent from sin. They turn from a life of sin and unbelief to a life of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. But then in the very next breath, they say, Oh, but there was still so much to do that I just kept working. You don't understand how valuable the blood of the Lamb of God slain from the foundation of the world on the cross of Calvary. You don't understand how valuable that blood is if you think you still have to work. You don't understand how powerful that blood is. You don't understand what that blood is capable of doing. Hallelujah. Oh, I want to tell you something. It is one thing to have a cleansing agent which is able to break away dirt and grime and grease from fabric or from some other surface. It's one thing to have a cleaning agent that can do that and have a cleaning agent that can do that, listen to me, and then leave the surface that it has just cleaned impervious to dirt and grime and grease from that day forward. But the blood of Jesus Christ does exactly that. Hallelujah. It does not just cleanse our past sins, but it does not permit any sin that we might commit from that day till the day of the resurrection. It does not permit any future sin, any future filth, any future dirt to stick to us. That dirt cannot affect us. We become impervious to sin. Oh, hallelujah. We are delivered not only from past transgression, but my friend, we are delivered from the effects of all sin from that day forward. Too many believers have fallen short of the promise set forth by the Lord concerning His rest. They continue to work in an effort to secure their salvation rather than to find that rest which the Lord has promised them who will believe and obey His glorious gospel. We sang the song this afternoon. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. That song was taken from Matthew 11, 28 through 30. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. For I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. I remember as a kid growing up in church and wrestling with certain issues. Dear God, I just knew if the trumpet sounded, I was going to split hell wide open. I knew that if the trump of God should sound, and the voice of the archangel should declare, Here is your king! Hallelujah! that I would miss the rapture and miss heaven because of things I thought and things that were happening inside of my mind and inside of my body. I just knew why. Because I didn't believe that the grace of God and the blood of Christ were powerful enough 
for me. My faith was not in my faith. It was in my ability to overcome those things that I saw as an obstacle to my salvation. The confusion often comes for many believers from a misunderstanding of the nature of the work of grace. If we fail to understand, listen, that grace does not change us. Grace does not change us. If a judge tells a man who has entered his courtroom for stealing bread to feed his family, if that just judge says to that man, I'm going to show you grace. I am not going to hold you accountable for this crime. Not because of who you are, not because of anything you've done, but I'm just in a good mood today, and I feel like doing this for you. That judge has done absolutely nothing to change that man. That man has not changed. He's the identical same man he was when he came in. No, grace does not change us. But it compensates, listen to me, for our inability to change. Then, after grace, we can accept the blessings and benefits of that favor. Believing that grace makes us into a worthy subject annihilates the very nature of grace. If grace makes us into something that now is worthy of God's favor and God's blessing, then my friend, it is no more grace. My Lord have mercy. This isn't hard to understand. Believing that grace makes us into a worthy subject destroys the nature of grace. Grace is favor which is unearned and undeserved. We access the grace of God through faith in His gospel. Therefore, our righteousness is born of faith through grace and has no connection whatsoever to our works or our efforts to make ourselves worthy. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, the Apostle Paul declares, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves it is the gift of God. Not of works, not of our efforts, not of our abilities, not of anything we have done, lest any man should boast. The Word of God promises that faith in Christ causes us to become a new creature or a new creation. We do not, however, go from sin fullness to sinlessness. Nor do we go from being an imperfect creature to becoming a perfect creature. Our transformation, listen to me children, this is where Christians down through the ages have gotten this all wrong. Our transformation comes in the form of relationship. What has changed? How are we now a new creature? We are changed from a vagabond wanderer, wanderer to a blood-bought, spirit-filled child of the King. Hallelujah! Our relationship has changed. And therefore, as a prince, everything has changed. 
chains. We're no longer a pauper. Hallelujah. We're no longer wandering the streets hungry and naked and barren and suffering. But we are a child of the King living in the household of Zion with every benefit of heaven at our disposal. Oh, hallelujah. That's what the word of God means when it says, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Former things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. It is the most idiotic perversion of Scripture that is preached by so many evangelical and fundamentalist churches. Bless God, if you're born again, then you'll be straight where you were gay. You know, you'll be this where you were that. Everything's going to change. The Word of God said everything changes. Yeah, but your hair color doesn't. But your weight doesn't. But your height doesn't. Well, that's ridiculous. Of course they'll say, well, wait a minute, honey. It's either behold all things have become new or it's not behold all things have become new. Don't you dare try and pick and choose. Which, well, but that's just a minute. No, 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 no. If we're going to be literalistic about this, then let's be literalistic about this. It's either all things become new or all things don't become new. But what becomes new and how does it become new? Everything becomes new. How? Because our relationship with God has changed. We have now become an adopted son or daughter of the king. And as such, our circumstance is brand new. We are not the same person that we were. Oh, we are, but we're not. Nothing in our personality has changed. Nothing in who we are as a human being has changed. But that relationship change has changed us so that now we are no longer pauper Joe but now we're Prince Joseph hallelujah glory to the Lamb of God our transformation comes in the form of relationship Unlike adoption in this world, which is merely a legal arrangement whereby one becomes the child of adoptive parents, listen, the process of adoption in divine terms is a fusion of God himself with us. That's what the Holy Ghost baptism is that results in our becoming his literal child. Oh, hallelujah. You see, when parents adopt a child in this life, that child doesn't go get a blood transfusion so that they share blood type, so that if a doctor were to prick that child's finger and test his blood, he would find that that child has the same blood type as his parents, as would perhaps be the normal scientific uh, chain of events. But when God adopts us <laughs> in this life, He gives us what the Word of God calls the earnest of our redemption. He gives us a down payment on our adoption by filling us with His Spirit. And by doing that, He changes our nature to the nature that He Himself possesses. Just as Adam was formed in the Garden of Eden, a living soul, the Word of God declares that we are all dead in trespass and in sin. But when God breathes His Spirit into us by the infilling of the Holy Ghost, it is the same as Him breathing into Adam's nostrils in the garden and what does the word of God declare and Adam became a living soul created 
in the image, in the image, oh hallelujah, in the image and in the likeness of God. So heavenly adoption is quite a bit different than earthly adoption. When God adopts us, he changes our nature so that we once again resemble him and reflect him. Oh, hallelujah. We are not just legally adopted by God our Father, but we are adopted in a very real and literal sense. In Romans 8.15, the Apostle Paul writes, For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father, hallelujah. In this life, our adoption is arranged and made legally binding within a court of law. But it is in the resurrection, excuse me, that is natural adoption. But our spiritual adoption is arranged in this life and it is made legally binding by reason of God filling us with his great Holy Ghost but it is in the resurrection that our adoption will be made complete and we will be changed listen to me children into that new creature which salvation promises but the Word of God tells us that God calls those things today which be not as though they were. Therefore, he says, if any man be in Christ, not he will be a new creature, but rather he is a new creature. But the fullness of that promise is not realized until after the resurrection. But by faith, God calls those things which be not as though they were. So God declares it today, even though it is not yet made a reality today. Say, Pastor, I don't know that I believe that. Well, maybe you'll believe the Word of God. Today we are called the adopted sons and daughters of God. But the completion of the adoption is yet to come. 1 John 3, 1 and 2. Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Beloved, John writes, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Do you see it now? Now we are called the sons of God, he said. But it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But now we are called the sons of God. Why? Because God calls those things which be not as though they were. Oh, hallelujah. In Romans chapter 8, verse 23, And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, listen, waiting for the adoption to wit the redemption of our body. 
Paul said, you've not received spirit of fear, but the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. But then he turns around and says, but our adoption is not complete until the resurrection. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, I want to tell you, too many people, this literalistic interpretation of every word of Scripture, rather than a careful, studious understanding of the whole, not just the part. Line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little, there a little. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed. Rightly dividing the word of truth. We've got a bunch of dinglings in our world today preaching people who call themselves believers, who call themselves Christians, into a state of fear and condemnation and guilt. And what they don't understand is what they are preaching is unbelief. They are preaching that what Jesus Christ did at Calvary is not sufficient for you because you aren't perfect. You're not making every decision right. You're not doing everything right. You're not living 100% as a creature that will enter heaven without sin. No, of course you're not. Because the Word of God tells us that we can't get into heaven in our current state. No, we've got to be changed somewhere between earth and heaven. Hallelujah. There has to be a change. This corruption must put on incorruption. This mortal must put on immortality. I'm telling the truth today. But you see, they take parts here and parts there. Remember what I said about all these dead doctrines that breathe death last week when I talked about the Frankenstein monster taking all these dead doctrines that breathe death and they try to breathe life into them by sewing them all together. Honey, you're not putting this thing together right. Because the righteousness of God through Jesus Christ our Lord has been applied to our life by faith, it is not possible, listen to me children, it is not possible that we should sin. Now you hear that and immediately people say, so what you're saying is that because the righteousness of Christ has been applied to my life, I'm not capable of sinning. No, I said it is not possible that we should sin. But listen, I haven't finished my statement yet. As all that God sees is the righteousness with which we are clothed. It's not possible that we could, it's impossible for us to sin. Does that mean it's impossible for us to sin? No. But it's impossible in God's eyes for us to sin. Oh, hallelujah. It is impossible in God's eyes for us to sin because all he sees is the righteousness of Christ which we have placed upon ourselves by faith in his gospel. In Romans 3 and verse 20, therefore by the deeds of the law there shall no flesh be justified. Listen, in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. But now listen to Colossians 1 19 through 22. For it pleased the Father that in him, the man Jesus, should all fullness dwell, and having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things, listen, unto himself. By him I say, whether they be things in earth, or things in heaven and you that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works 
yet now hath he reconciled in the body of his flesh through death, listen, to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable. Here's the three magic words. In his sight. Hallelujah. Glory to God. When that relationship changes from unbeliever to believer, when that relationship changes from sinner to son, God looks at you entirely different. Your faith has changed everything. God looks at you entirely different. There is a reason why in this world there is not a court in the world that will allow a mother or a father or a sibling or a family member to serve on a jury or to sit as a judge when someone is convicted or being prosecuted for a crime. There's a reason why this is not permitted. Why? Because mom is never going to see you the way the other 11 jurors do. Dad is never going to look at you. Cousin Billy and brother Phil is never going to look at you the same way that a non-related completely unattached entity or individual might look at you. Do you think, are you so foolish as not to understand that when you believe and obey this gospel, God begins to look at you differently. You are now His child. And as his child, I've said it before, I'll say it again. You can do no wrong. Hallelujah. You ever seen a kid and you about wanted to bust him across the rear end with a brick because he was acting up and playing the fool? And yet there sat mom, there sat dad, patient as all get out. Oh, Billy, now you calm down. Oh, Billy, now you stop acting like that. And you're about to lose your mind. You want to grab that kid and, and teach him a lesson on how to act right. But mom and or dad are standing there and they're patiently, gently dealing with that child. Why? Because that's their kid. It's not your kid, it's their kid. Got news for you today. When we believe and obey this gospel, you become God's kid and God looks at you very differently. Why must we keep the faith until the end? Why is our faith the most important uh, commodity that we have as a child of God? Because it is our faith that maintains us in that father-child relationship. See, Daddy can adopt you. The king can adopt you. And you can choose to go back to the streets and live like a vagabond. You can choose to leave home and to go back and live like you used to live because maybe you like their friends there better. Maybe you like the things you did when you were in that position better. Oh my. So our faith is essential to maintaining that relationship and that relationship is essential to God looking at us in a certain way oh hallelujah yet the word of God uses language at times which suggests that we are in fact able to sin my Lord, here comes that contradiction. Here comes that confusion that so many people have. Well, but Pastor, you're saying in the eyes of God, we cannot sin. 
And yet the word of God tells us in 1 John 1, 7 through 10, but if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, listen, cleanseth us from all sin. That is present tense. Not only is it present tense, but it is perpetually present tense. The blood of Jesus Christ cleanseth us, meaning over and over and over and over again, His blood keeps cleansing. His blood keeps cleansing. His blood keeps cleansing. Then John writes in verse 8, 1 John 1, If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make Him a liar and His word is not in us. So wait a minute, Pastor. On one hand, the writer tells us that God's people cannot sin. On the next hand, it says, but when we sin, here's how we address it. Here's how we deal with it. In 1 John 2, verses 1 and 2, the same author writes, My little children, these things write I unto you, that ye sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. I've told you before in preaching, this should read the righteousness of Jesus Christ. What advocates for us? The righteousness of Jesus Christ. Listen, and he is the appropriation for our sins. And not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. He satisfies the debt. He satisfies not just for those who believe the gospel. It doesn't mean that those in the world who haven't believed are going to be saved. But it means they're passing up on an awful good deal because their sins have been paid for. Their sins have been covered understanding the change in relationship brought about by our faith in the gospel is key to understanding how the Lord sees us after we have believed and obeyed the gospel. Now listen carefully. We will yet one day be responsible for all deeds done in the flesh. But we are not condemned by our weaknesses. We are not condemned by our frailties. We are not condemned by our sins. We will be responsible for the hurt or the loss that those actions may have caused. However, listen to Romans 8, 1 through 4. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus, listen, hath made me free, free, free from the law of sin and death. Sin does not result in death for the believer. What, For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, listen, condemned the sinner. No condemned sin in the flesh. Oh, hallelujah. 
Oh my Lord. That the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Oh, hallelujah. How do we walk after the Spirit? Is that about walking perfectly? No. Keep it in context, folks. Paul was writing here to people who could not understand that salvation was possible without obeying the edicts of the law. And he was trying to draw a contrast. He was trying to help them understand. He started out... There's no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit. When he says here who walk not after the flesh, he's not talking about lust. He's not talking about lying. He's not talking about cheating. He's not talking about, no, he's talking about the law because the law was fleshly. The law required our efforts and our works. Paul said, there is therefore now no condemnation to them who walk not after the flesh. They're not walking after the law. They're not trying to do things on their own. But they walk after the spirit because the spiritual life is a life of faith. Therefore the word of God declares, the just shall live by faith. To walk in the Spirit is to walk by faith. To walk by faith is to walk in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. So that God sees us only through the veil of the righteousness of Christ. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin, condemned sin. So the sinner is not condemned. Sin itself is condemned. John three sixteen through 18 For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world. What? For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world might, through him, might be saved. He that believeth on him, O oh my Lord, is not condemned. But he that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Oh, hallelujah. Do you see? where our faith frees us from the condemnation. Oh my Lord, have mercy. Romans chapter 3, verses 21 through 28 today. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, or being foretold by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, listen, unto all and upon all them that believe. For there is no difference, meaning between Jew and Greek, bond or free, male or female. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of of God being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation through faith in His blood to declare His righteousness for the remission of sins 
that are passed through the forbearance of God to declare, I say, at this time His righteousness that He might be just. Listen. And the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. But now listen to what Paul said. Remember what he said, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Now listen to what Paul says in Romans 3, verse 27. Where is boasting then? He said, what can you brag about then? What? God's done all this. God's done. Every bit of this is God's doing. Doesn't have nothing to do with you. So, so where, where's your boasting? He said, it is excluded. That it has no place. By what law? Where's your boasting? What law gives you the right to boast? He said, of works? Nay, but by the law of faith. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. How many Christians today go to church every Sunday and you're miserable? You're constantly in a state of condemnation. You're constantly in a state of guilt. What you ought to be in is in a constant state of gratitude and a constant state of worship and appreciation for what God has done for you. When you come into the house of God, put on the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. Hallelujah. Come into a lot of churches. I grew up in church, and I'm telling you, it's sickening to me that so many people go into the church house, and they go into the church house light and leave heavy, when it's supposed to be the opposite of that. You go in heavy, and you leave light. When you understand the grace of God. When you understand the mercy and the forbearance of God. Yes, we know that we fail to meet a standard that God would have us to meet. Because it's about our being the greatest, most effective testimony to an unsaved world that we can be. And when we fall short of that, we're not to come to the altar snotting and weeping and wailing all over the altar because we fear we're going to go to hell. No, but we should come to the altar repenting and saying, Lord, help me. I want to be a better testimony than that. I want to be able to better do my job as a child of God. I want to better be able to lead others to the foot of the cross. And as long as I keep doing and saying and acting foolishly, I cannot be as effective as I know you'd like me to be. Lord, I know I'm falling short. I know my fruit is not what it ought to be. I'm not being as fruitful. The fruit that is coming forth from my branch is not as plentiful as it ought to be. Help me, Lord, to draw closer to you that I might be more fruitful. Not help me, Lord, because I'm going to go to hell. I'm going to miss the rapture. I'm not going to make it, Lord. No. Honey, if that's your prayer then you're coming at God from a place of unbelief. You don't understand what Jesus did for you. You don't understand the power of the blood. You don't understand the work of grace. And you certainly don't understand how to access that grace by faith. But until you access that grace by faith, You'll never access, listen to me, His righteousness as your covering. So today, my friend, I ask this question. Have you found that promised rest which was offered by our Lord, which comes in response to faith in the accomplished work 
of Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary? Have you found that rest? Or can you not quite accept the full sufficiency of the sacrifice of Christ? Are you living in the rest offered by the Lord? Or are you still working? 